Hi, I'm Marin Somerset Webb, Editor-in-Chief of Money Week magazine, and welcome to another one of our video interviews. Here with me today is Hugo Dixon, who is the founder of Breaking Views and the author of this just published book, The In-Out Question. Uh, the In-Out Question, obviously, well, not obviously, but it's got the rest of the title, and you will see that uh, Hugo's answer to the Brexit question is that we should definitely stay in the EU. So we're going to talk a bit about that today. Those of you who've watched our videos will have seen that we've recently interviewed several people who are very firmly in favor of Brexit. So what I want to do here is ask Hugo to put the opposite case. Regular readers will know that um, I'm rather pro-Brexit myself, so don't think that this is going to be a debate, particularly because it's not. I just want Hugo to put, put his viewpoint so we can all see both sides and start to make rational decisions about everything. So, Hugo. Great, Mary. Your side, the staying inside. Let's start with something very simple. Let's just give us, uh, give us the three top reasons why we'd be nuts to leave the European Union. Okay, I think the first is the economy. Mm -hmm. If we leave the EU, we will struggle to have full access to the single market, mm -hmm. um, which counts for half of our, our trade. Half? Um, 40%. Half of our trade. Half of our trade. If you look at it, both exports and imports, um, look at goods and services, last year it was 49%. Okay, you can call it 49% if you prefer, but half seems to me a good round number. Um, second thing is that we would also struggle to have as much influence on a whole series of other political foreign policy issues that concern us, things that cross borders, such as cross-border crime, terrorism, climate change, etc., if we pulled out of the EU. And the third reason is Scotland, that if we leave the EU, the Scots will almost certainly have a second referendum on quitting the UK, and they probably will quit the UK. Now, of course, if you don't want Scotland to stay in the UK, then that actually might be a reason to vote for Brexit. But if you think that actually the UK is stronger by keeping Scotland in the UK, that's another reason well, like to vote to stay in the EU. I suspect you'll find that an awful lot of English people are now so fed up with Scotland, they would vote for Brexit just to get rid of them. But uh, Yeah, well, that, that, <laughs> and if that's their view, then, then we can discuss that too. I think it actually would be damaging for us to lose Scotland. Yeah, okay, well, should we... Uh, why don't we just knock Scotland out of the way quickly? We'll go through all three of these things, but let's okay, start with good. Scotland. Um, so you, you think that the Scottish are much more likely to vote to stay in than the English, and if they were to vote to stay in, we, and the English were to vote to stay out, the Scottish would demand another referendum. I mean, the, the first point to make there surely is that the polls don't show the Scots and the English as being that far apart anymore. Mm. You know, it's one of the one of the only things that the Social Attitude Survey ever shows to be a statistically significant difference between the, the rest of the UK and the Scots is, is European Union membership. But that gap mm. has been narrowing and narrowing over the last you know, five or six months. So it's, it's, a, it's not a given, is it? It's not an absolute given, um, but I still think there's a gap. It's certainly the polls that I've seen show mm. a gap. Um, and if you found that the English voted out and the Scots voted in, I think that it would be almost impossible for us to deny the Scots a second referendum. Mm. Mm. And you then think that there's a possibility that the Scots would then vote out yeah. vote to leave the UK? Yeah, yeah. yeah. because they'd ha also have a second... They, 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 there are many who actually th felt that, you know, they, they, they're having sort of buyer's remorse of actually having voted to stay in the UK mm. last year. Um, if you then added an, a second reason, which is that they wouldn't be part of the EU anymore, it, assuming, as it were, that more than half of them actually want mm. to be part of the EU, mm. then I think that would give you an yeah. extra fillip. Yeah, I know I said I wasn't going to disagree with you, but I think it's absolute nonsense. There's a, what, why do you think uh, it's well, nonsense? There's v I think there's very little buyer's remorse, and you see the polls moving off the referendum to roughly where they were before the referendum. Mm -hmm. When people vote, as I'm sure we'll get onto later, mm. they tend to vote for the status quo. And mm. one of the main reasons, of course, that a lot of people voted uh, to leave the, leave the rest of the UK in the referendum was because they believed that the economy in Scotland would be better as a result. Mm. But of course, now with the plummeting oil price, which was the only argument, really, for a, a, better, mm -hmm. a better Scotland economically post-leaving, with the oil price well below $40, everyone now knows that that's, that's obvious nonsense. Mm. So um, I, my own view is it's incredibly unlikely for the Scottish to vote to leave the UK in another, another referendum. But I see. You know, well, this is, I mean, this you live there, this so is all you, guesswork, you may have more information guesswork. than I do on that um, And also, of, of course, you know, 
there's uh, there's this idea, I think, possibly in, in the rest of the UK, maybe even in the rest of the world, that you know there is now a, a majority of Scots who would like to see uh, uh, to see Scotland separate from the rest of the UK, but that's not what the polls tell us. Mm. Um, you know, a good 50% plus of of the Scots um, are still very happy inside the union. So. Mm. Anyway, I mean, that's a, uh, an argument that unfortunately is going to run and run and run, but I think it's very unlikely that the Scots would leave. So while I'm not going to argue with you, I discount that bit completely. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, would, I, I, I wouldn't be nearly as sanguine as you, the very, very unlikely. Oh, I'm not sanguine. I mean, I mean this you may say very, very, very unlikely, very unlikely, unlikely. You may say, I mean, it, I, look, I, I, I think very, very unlikely mm. is an exaggeration. But I'll tell you what, actually, I mean, even and if... And you've got to think that it, actually the chances of... I mean, Whatever you think the chances are, mm. um, the chances of the Scots leaving the UK go up if we vote to leave. They do, and actually, the EU. regardless so at least we agree of that, on that point. yeah, and regardless, regardless of what the Scots might vote, were there a second referendum, the very fact of a second referendum will be so unbelievably damaging to Scotland and the the Scottish economy that simply having the referendum is is a risk to mm. the Scottish economy and, and mm. hence to the UK as a whole. So, regardless of the outcome, so I'll accept that that's a that's a risk, mm -hmm. uh, but as, okay. a as a whole, it's a, I'm not sure it's quite enough. So let's go to the, the important issues. Let's go first yes. to the economy, shall we? Yes, yes. Well, as I say, I think we'd struggle to get um, as good access to the single market if we left the EU. And um, I think okay, you're okay, aware. Okay, let's okay. talk about that. How would that happen? How would that happen? So we, we vote out. Um, we vote out. Nothing's going to happen in the first year, the first two years. It's a relatively lengthy negotiation to leave, apart from anything else, right? Well, there's a two-year negotiation. So, uh, so no companies turn around the day after the referendum and go, I'm not going to deal with those people anymore. They're not inside the EU. So nothing I'm happens not, initially. I'm not so sure about that, actually. Well, I've been, I've been dealing with that machine parts company in Birmingham for 25 years, but now that England isn't in the EU anymore, I've decided not to. No, that's, that's not, not quite what how I said. It works, that's not it? what I said. No, but I think that I mean, in, in terms of day-to-day -day trade, nothing mm. would change. But in terms of investment, things might change as soon as you've actually had that vote. Because I think then companies that are thinking either British companies mm. or foreign companies who are thinking of investing in the UK, increasing their investment perhaps in the UK, they would probably put that on hold until they knew what the relationship between the UK and the EU was going to be, particularly if their investment in the UK was partly dependent on exports to the rest of Europe. So I think the idea that nothing would change for two years, I think you're wrong there. Then of course the question is, what actually happens? What actually would the deal be at the end of those two years. And um, it's a bit difficult to know what, what the deal would be. We just, um, it's, you know, there are several models out there. Mm. There's the Norwegian model, there's the Swiss model. I and mean, you're really probably aware of- We don't the Norwegian model, do we? Because then we have um, all the downsides and none of the upsides. No, you that's not- You get to pay all the money, you get to deal yeah. with all the regulations, um, but you don't get a seat at the table. That's right, but you do- So but, we're not crazy for that one. Well, I'm certainly not crazy for that one. I don't think that the British people would be crazy for that one. Um, and I think that particularly if you think that one of the reasons why the British people would have voted for coming out is because they don't want free movement of people. If you think that's going to be the most salient issue in the campaign, the Norwegians actually have got to provide free movement of people um, within the EU. Because so that's the deal that they made on the side with is, the EU? No, well, that is the deal that they have as part of what's called the EEA, which they're part of, the European Economic Area, which mm. is a sort of uh, a, a, an outer ring outside the EU, which is what Norway's part of. But, but th what Norway do get, which is important, is that they get almost complete access to the single market. And you say almost? They, what they, uh, they've, they're not part of the agricultural arrangements, they're not part of the fisheries arrangements. Well, that's all rather good, isn't it? And, well, it is and it isn't, but it, it what, what, I mean, it's, it's, it, 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 as far as fisheries are concerned, it's, I mean, of course, they, they quite liked not being part of the fisheries arrangement, but it also means that when, uh, the, there was a time when they were trying to export fish to the EU, and the EU slapped anti-dumping duties on Norwegian salmon, for example. Um, the other thing that, that... But to be fair, they were dumping salmon. <laughs> they probably were. Okay, I mean. But if they were... Anyway, look, I, I think that for us, fisheries is, 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 a, is, a, is a fairly small thing. As far as agriculture is concerned, I think for us, actually it would matter if we were not able to export 
our agricultural product to the EU without facing a tariff. I mean, the tariff duties, the taxes, the import taxes that the EU imposes on agricultural produce from outside the EU are, I, I don't have the numbers, but I think it's something in the sort of 15% range. So that would be quite damaging for our agriculture. Our agriculture would also, our, you could say, well, we wouldn't have to be part of this ghastly common agricultural policy. No, I was going to say that. Wouldn't that be great? All those, in a way, it would all be. those distorting subsidies and market destroying mechanisms yeah. gone in one fell swoop. It, it would be in theory, but in practice, um, is that actually likely to happen? I mean, my fear is that if we left, what you'd the, the farmers' lobby here wouldn't go away. They'd immediately demand a similar set of subsidies from our own government, and they'd probably get but wouldn't them. Wouldn't we notice there aren't very many of them? Maybe. They, well, they could lobby away. Well, we could ignore them. We could ignore them, and it would be interesting to see what the battle would be. Mm. But I think that what you'd what you'd have is you'd have a huge pressure to to replicate the subsidies, and you'd have the problem that our farmers wouldn't have access for their produce um, to the the EU market without this um, tariff. So the tariff, which mm. would effectively mm. mean that they were uncompetitive. But these are fairly minor things, as we said. Norway. Is, um, is, is the country which has got the most access to the single market without being in the EU. But they still have to pay for access. Um, it's about 80 or 90 percent per head as much as what we pay in terms of our contribution to the budget. And they don't get to sit around the table and they don't therefore get to make the rules. Now, people don't like the rules, some of the rules of the, of the EU. But we barely get to make any of the rules. We're outvoted all the time, aren't We're we? We're not I mean, outvoted the whole time. such a huge That's number a complete of myth. members now. That's a it? myth. That's a myth, yes. Go on then. Well, Debunk it for me. Okay. There are 28 countries, but we are, um, uh, we are the second largest equal mm -hmm. with France. We, the voting in the Council of Ministers is based on population. Um, we get 12.6% of the votes. Okay, that's not a majority. We don't have a veto power, but we are pretty influential in terms of what we want to do. And when you look at, when you look at um, particular industries, take the most important industry, finance, money week, the industry that you spend all your time um, in, in enmeshed in, um, there's only one significant thing that we have been outvoted on, which is bankers' bonuses. Mm. This cap on bankers' bonuses, they, they can't be more than once or twice salary, depending on whether you have a shareholder vote or whatever it is. That's the only thing that we've been outvoted on in our most important industry. If we were not at the table when the financial regulations are being determined, but we still had to follow those financial regulations, which is what Norway has to do, our most important industry would be at a severe disadvantage. Okay, what if it was a nice thing if we didn't have that as our most important industry anymore? Well, I mean, that's a good, a good way of, of, of destroying quite a lot of livelihoods and wealth, is just to uh, destroy the, the financial services industry. I mean, if you want to do that, I mean, and if good the, luck if to the you. the financial services industry here continued to follow all the same regulations and we can easily do that i mean one of the if, yeah but if, if, it's, if, if, they're we, set, if, if those regulations are EU, set by the, if those mm. regulations are set by the eu and we have to follow them mm -hmm. that the chance that they're going to be set in such a way as to be detrimental uh, to our industry is very has high. gone up we yeah. at least have a chance to stop them. In most cases, we have. In only one case, significant case, we've lost out. Well, you say um, that we have, we've negotiated and compromised and accepted. Yeah, but we often led the debate, actually, on financial regulation. Mm. Uh, most of the things that are coming out uh, have come out uh, 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 in, uh, uh, from Brussels over the last few decades on financial regulation have had a very significant British imprint on them, whether it's increasing the capital that banks have got to take or leading to better um, consumer protections or, um, or, or, I mean, a whole raft of different things that have mm. been coming through. Britain has had an influential role, first directly through its influence in Brussels and indirectly through international um, standards bodies such as the Baal Committee, etc., which are then brought but back into... 
the EU. There does still seem to be an enormous amount of regulation coming through in the financial arena that I'm not entirely convinced that the financial industry is happy to sign up to. I mean, if well, the financial for industry example, won't be happy Nifid with more. on its way through and, uh, you know, all this kind of thing. It's, it's pretty endless. And if you work inside the financial industry, and you'll know this, of course, there must at some point be a hope that it will just stop. Just stop the layer upon layer upon layer upon layer and being, being outside while it comes with um, no end You seem to be arguing both sides of the case. On the one hand, that it would be better for Britain to have a much, much smaller financial industry. No, I'm, the not other a, I'm not arguing that was flippant. I don't think that for a second. Well, okay, well, is that maybe some of well, your viewers who think that. Um, and then on the other no, hand, and then, on, well, and then yeah. on the other hand, yeah. do you seem to be saying, oh, we must get rid of all these regulations on this industry. But, I, I, but can I just come back on that? Yeah. I mean, I think, it's I think the financial industry did mess up big time. And we shouldn't forget that. It needed to be more heavily regulated. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't agree with all the regulations that have come through, but the broad thrust of the regulation that we've had since Lehman Brothers, since Northern Rock, has been beneficial. It's been about strengthening the capital of banks. It's been about making sure that if banks get into trouble, that their bondholders and shareholders actually have to bear the pain rather than the taxpayers having to bail them out. Now that's something that's hugely advantageous and it's very important that that's done not just on a one country basis because if we were regulating our industry much much more tightly and the rest of Europe was taking a lax approach that would put our industry at a very big competitive advantage. And if there it was the other way around? If it was the other, other way around, then of course our industry would be at a competitive advantage. But actually, when you actually see what's happened since the, since the financial crisis, actually, the UK has, with the exception of bankers' bonuses, has been pushing, generally speaking, for more financial regulation than the continent, for the very good reason that we've got the biggest financial industry, and therefore we suffer the biggest risk if it blows up. Mm. I mean, we, the whole British economy could have been destroyed if that industry had totally blown up in 2007, 2008. Whereas in Germany, it's a much smaller part of their economy, etc. So therefore, it's actually in our interest to have a reasonably level playing field with a single set of regulations, which Britain plays an important role in determining. If we leave the EU, either we won't have full access to that market. And in, in finance, the I mean, there are lots, so many different sectors of finance, but broadly speaking, being member of the EU gives us what's called a passport to operate across the EU. That means that we're, we can have companies that are based here in the UK, which can offer their services right across the EU um, by being regulated in Britain. If we left the EU and we didn't come to some special arrangement then we wouldn't have access to that passport. Our firms would not be able to provide those services across the EU. That would be a huge blow yeah, to British business. But as you business. say, we probably would come to that arrangement Norway style. We just wouldn't have input into what the regulations were. If we were prepared to have the Norwegian approach, mm -hmm. if we were prepared to follow all the rules of the single market without having a vote on those rules, if we were prepared to go ahead and continue having free movement of people, yes, what you say is true but that would be in my view a very very second rate position because you would have these rules that would be set not with our interests at heart they might even be set um, deliberately to do down the city there are lots of people in France who'd love to try to you know fix the regulations in such a way that the city was disadvantaged my goodness if, what a mean thing to do what a mean thing to do but that's the reality you would have known those Europeans could be so nasty well everybody can be nasty can't they even Brits sometimes can be nasty. The other thing, though, is that if you don't go for, for the Norwegian example, there is no other um, country which has a free trade agreement with the EU that has got such a passport for financial services. The Swiss don't have it. The Canadians, which is probably the most extensive free trade agreement we have with any country mm -hmm. outside um, the EU, don't have it. Um, outside Europe don't have it. The Americans, will, well, Europe doesn't yet have a free trade agreement with America, but as part of this negotiation with America, that doesn't give their 
financial firms a passport to operate within the EU. They can only operate if you're Goldman Sachs or Morgan Stanley. You can only provide those services across the EU when you're located within the EU. That's why a lot of them locate themselves in London. Mm -hmm. Or in Ireland. So, so, or in Ireland or, or, or wherever. That's why a lot of Swiss banks locate themselves in London. They can't mm. do the business out of Switzerland. Um, so I, I think this is the economic argument. And equally, uh, it's not just finance. I mean, it's also, say, automotives. Um, I mean, 30 years ago, we would have thought that the car industry was a, a bad joke in the UK with sort of British Leyland, et cetera, et cetera. But there's been a massive revival, largely on the basis of foreign investment into the UK the Nissans, the General Motors. And do you Motors. think none of that would have happened if we weren't a member of the EU? No, I don't. I'm not absolutist about it. I don't say none of this would have happened. I don't say that if we leave the EU, we're going to lose all of our trade with the EU. I mean, often Eurosceptics try to paint uh, the position of people like me as so, so extreme. It's not a matter of black and white. It's a, a matter of different 50 shades of grey. And we would lose some access if we, if what, if again, if we just relied on the World Trade Organization, often you find sort of the campaigning organizations like Vote Leave saying, or, or Nigel Lawson, for example, saying we should rely on our membership of the World Trade Organization. That's what's going to give us this fantastic access. And you don't think that would be enough? Well, if we rely on our World Trade Organization, let's just take that on face value, um, the automotive industry. Would the EU imposes a 10% tariff on automotive imports. So cars that we would export to the EU would face a 10% tax. 10% tax in the car industry is a huge difference. That mm. would essentially wipe out the profit margins and more of the car industry here. Um, what would happen then is that any new investment that these car, industry, these car companies were making in the UK they would probably shift to a location the other side of the channel. And you don't think that could be negotiated away? Well, I think it could be negotiated, but we don't know what's all the best. What are we prepared to do? Are we prepared to accept free movement of people? Are we prepared to accept their regulations? Are we prepared to pay into their budget? If we're prepared to do all those three things, I think we can get around all of these problems. Mm -hmm. But yeah. if we're prepared to, 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 to pay into their budget, if we're prepared to have free movement of people and if we're prepared to um, abide by their regulations, we're much better off staying in and actually having a say over those regulations. Mm. Now, free movement of people does seem like it's going to be something of a sticking point here, doesn't it? Mm. I and mean, this does seem to be the thing that people care about with good reason, obviously, more than anything else, the protection oh, of know. borders. And, uh, you know, if you look back at... Uh, look back at the history of the EU so far, you know, it's faced, what, two major crises, really, the financial crisis and the current migration crisis, and someone sitting in the UK could say, well, this hasn't gone that well, and the free movement of people is beginning to be something of a problem. Okay, but there are, I think you have smooshed two issues what together, <laughs> yeah, that, and it's very important to distinguish these uh -huh. things. There's the free movement of people within the EU, mm -hmm. and there is the migration crisis, which oh, is no. about refugees from oh, outside yes, the Oh yes, but EU. you're separating them when perhaps they are the same thing, in that once refugees have moved into Europe, and once they've uh, you know, become settled, claim asylum, etc., and once, once they um, become a resident of any one of these countries, then they do have free movement into the other countries. So you can say they're different things, but in the end, they're the same things. They're, well. And, you know, that, uh, people, people seeking asylum inside Europe can then move around inside Europe. So uh, they can't. Not they, initially. They but can't until they are. They, someone who takes as, gets asylum inside Europe um, can't, doesn't have the free movement of people until they become an EU citizen, which may never happen, but mm. which may happen several, several years later. Um, but the idea. Also, you, you talked. I mean, but I, I do think that these are. It's very important when and when it's very important to, to dis distinguish these two things. I mean, and also you have to think how many people are going to be coming in. Mm. How many people are going to be coming? Okay, so maybe there's maybe there's a million people who are going to come in this year. Maybe there's another million people. Say there are five million people that come in over the next five years. I don't know. Let's take that as an ex example. That's five million more people who would have free movement of people within the EU on top of the five hundred million who are already there. Mm -hmm. It's not. Um, it's not likely to move the needle a huge amount. Mm 
in terms of the free movement of people. I do think, therefore, it's important to distinguish the two. And as far as the refugee crisis is concerned, Britain is largely insulated from it. People who come in as refugees, as asylum seekers, who come from Syria, who cross into Turkey, who come into Greece, mm -hmm. they then go up through the Balkans. They are inside what's known as the Schengen area. Mm -hmm. But Britain is not part of the Schengen area. When you talk about, you talk about sort of, you know, that there's no, no borders or borders, no, no borders within Europe, etc. There are no borders within the Schengen area, but there is a border between Britain and the Schengen area. Last time you arrived at Heathrow, did you have to show your passport? Mm. Yes, there's a border control. It's actually this thing that says course, border force. It calls no, but there are now border controls going up across Europe as well. And um, Schengen is beginning to fail. Yes, but we're not part of Schengen. That's irrelevant for us. We, we have the best of both worlds. We're in the EU, but we're not part of Schengen. You also mentioned about the, the Euro crisis, which indeed is a disaster for the countries in the Eurozone, but we're not part of the single currency. That is we're true, but in we're, the EU, that's but true. not in the Euro. Absolutely, we have but the best of both worlds. But all these crises, you know, they, they change the way Europe operates, and every time there's a crisis and there's a, you know, a new deal of some kind and talks about a new treaty, you move a little bit further. I'm simply setting the other case here. You simply move a little further towards uh, European integration, towards more power at the centre, towards more bureaucracy, etc. And that's one of the things that you know, the people who are keen on the UK leaving look at and go, well, hang on, this is a, it's a continent in crisis. It's a continent trying to deal with that crisis by uh, becoming more and more integrated. And maybe as that crisis develops, it's something we don't particularly want to be attached to. They clearly, they do have problems within the Eurozone and they clearly have problems within Schengen. We are not part of either of those mm -hmm. um, situations. Um, and there has been a little bit of extra integration in the Eurozone to deal with the crisis, but it's an integration which has not affected the UK. For example, the most important, the two most important things that they agreed within the Eurozone were that the European Central Bank should act as the supervisor for banks within their banking union. But Britain is not part of the banking union, so that integration does not affect us. Secondly, the other thing they agreed was this, it was setting up something called the European Stability Mechanism, which is a 500 billion euro, I think it's 500 billion euro mm -hmm. fund, to bail out countries that are, have got trouble. But Britain is not part of the European mm. Stability Mechanism. Mm. So again, what you've seen is you've seen some integration, but it's not integration that's affected no, the no, UK. No, no, it doesn't affect us. but. I think there's a sense that at some point it will. You know, let's say that uh, the debt crisis returns to hit Italy, to hit France, etc., whatever, um, and everyone needs to pull together to keep everything on, to keep the show on the road. Does England stand fully aside from that? Does Britain stand fully aside from that? Do we have no responsibility to it as part of the European Union? We don't, and because it's because we're not part of the eurozone, and mm -hmm. we shouldn't, and we won't, and I'm, I'm but now. You say okay. So let's look at let's look at let's look at the the refugee crisis. What have we agreed? And and then there's somewhat not separate from the refugee crisis, but is certainly it's somewhat linked to it, which is the the terrorists who have been able to take advantage of Schengen's leaky borders to come across, like you know Abdul Hamid Abaoud, who was coming from Syria and was the mastermind of the Paris attacks. Um, what is Europe, what is the European Union doing as a result of that? Well, the main thing that they're doing is that they're trying to tighten up Schengen's borders. Mm -hmm. But that's not anything that affects us. Except that we have decided out of our own free will that we, we I think we've got a frigate in the Mediterranean which is taking part in this sort of um, rescue operation of, 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 of people who may be drowning in the Mediterranean and are helping to police the borders a bit. Um, but again, if they decide to reinforce their frontier, the frontier between, say, Greece and Turkey, um, that's not a bad thing for us, but it's not particularly, it, I mean, it's, it's slightly a good thing for us, actually, but it's, it's, not, our, it's, it's not our main beef. But we, again, we, have a, we actually have a best-of-both-worlds situation there because 
we are um, a member of what's called the Dublin Regulation. And the Dublin Regulation says, simply, that if an asylum seeker arrives in the EU, it has to be processed by the country where that person arrives. Mm. And if that person then goes to another EU country, that other EU country can send that asylum seeker back to the first port of entry. Britain is part of that arrangement. We benefit from it. We've sent back about 12,000 asylum seekers since 2003. Because we're rarely the first port of, port of entry. We're rarely mm. the first port of entry. But, but, and, and, and people find it actually quite difficult to get here. People say, oh my God, there are all these people in Calais. Well, why are they in Calais? They're in Calais because they can't get to the UK. It's quite difficult because we've got a channel and we've got so border force, etc., etc. So why do they stay in Calais? Well, I haven't been to Calais, but I think one of the reasons they stay in Calais is because they are hoping that there may be a way of, of getting in. You know, I mean, there's all Why? this thing... Why? What's wrong with France? Well, there's nothing, nothing particularly wrong with France, but as you know, Britain has got much um, better um, uh, growing economy at the moment. I mean, we, uh, our economy is about the same size. We're about as rich as the French, but we have a more flexible market-oriented economy. We've better at creating jobs at the moment. We've got lower unemployment. So it's worth and sitting in a nasty camp in Calais for six months and the desperate effort that you can jump onto the side of a speeding train to make it to London. I don't know, actually. Well, I haven't, it seems, I haven't, it seems I haven't, kind of bonkers. I, I, I haven't been there. I haven't asked people why they're not, and wh why they don't want to go to, why they don't want to go to Germany. I mean, maybe, they, maybe some of these people have got friends and family here. Mm. I don't know. There may be individual circumstances that make it more attractive for them wanting mm. to come here. Okay, let's look briefly at um, free movement inside inside the eurozone. Um, you know, I suspect that an inside the EU. Sorry, okay. inside the EU. Yes, um, an awful lot of people are going to look at this business of David Cameron promising to do something about in-work benefits and say people couldn't claim for four years, and now backing away from that because the you know obviously it's not going to be allowed. Um, why would the Polish put up with that? Um, Mm. And people are going to look at that and say, well, hang on, if we want to restrict access to our own benefits in our own country and we're not allowed to do that by the, by the EU, this, this sort of backs up the idea that our sovereignty is somehow being you know, chipped away at by a supranational organization above us. And that doesn't seem quite right. I mean, that looks like it's going to be one of the, one of the problems for David Cameron going into the referendum, right? Uh, but yeah. he said he wanted to do a couple of very specific things. He did, he but did. But a I must supernational organisation is saying, well, you can't do that stuff. And that brings you back to everything that Vote Leave, etc. say, which is, you know, this is a matter of sovereignty. It's not a matter of trade or the financial industry or regulations here, regulations there. It's a matter of being able to control your own borders, your own finances, your own ideas about who should receive what benefits, when, how, who should live where, etc. Um, well, that's quite a big deal. I don't think the four-year in-work benefits is a big deal, but I think that the principle that you're talking about... That's what I mean. The, is the, get, principle the, you're the, thing. the principle you're talking about is an important principle, um, but I think that you need to put it in context. And my argument would be that yes it's nice to have sovereignty but also sometimes you have to make compromises if you actually want to achieve more they in life big compromises aren't they well i, mean, you know, I don't you, know you if say, you want you to say, have if you want to have a single market you have got to have certain but let's, se you, let's you, if you got to, if you want to have a single market you basically got to have a single set of rules mm -hmm. if it's going to be a single set of rules it's not going to be rules that Britain gets to di dictate, or France gets to dictate, or Germany gets to dictate, mm. they all have to agree to some extent. So you have to, what, what, ha what, what you do is that in order to actually achieve more, you have to reach a deal. You have to reach, and a deal almost always involves a compromise. Mm. And then the question is, do you get more out of this than you lose? And if you say, we must always have exact sovereignty on absolutely everything we do, and we must never agree to anything that another country wants us to do. I doubt anybody then, would say that, but let's go then back you to in-work be, benefits. You, you know, you wouldn't be part of NATO, for example. Yeah, but in-work benefits, mean, part of go NATO, back to that's a, part a detail. Of NATO. Well, it's you know, not being detail. Part NATO part is a very important thing, no, much NATO, more important no, than in-work benefits. That's exactly my point. NATO, as part that's of exactly NATO, my point. As part of NATO, if somebody invades Turkey, for so example... So you can't argue with Hugo because he just talks over you anyway. That's why we're not having a debate. 
you could come back with me. But if just I think the NATO thing is important. NATO membership involves a loss of sovereignty. Do you agree? Of course. Then the question is, do we benefit from that or not? I would say we do benefit from mm. that. You could, some people might say we don't benefit, but you can judge it. Mm. So it's a matter of principle. The membership of the EU does involve some loss of sovereignty. My contention is we benefit more from it than we lose. Sorry. Okay. Well, I suppose I would, I would say in response to that, that uh, you're absolutely right about NATO and uh, the loss of sovereignty for these huge, big things is, is something that I think people are more prepared to put up with than little things. And you say inward benefits is not particularly important. It's just it's minor. Okay, well, that's the important thing. It's minor. We can't make minor decisions for ourselves. Uh, we have these imposed upon us. Now, let me tell you about a very, very minor decision. I wrote about this in an editor's letter in Money Week a little while ago, and everyone thinks I'm an idiot, but it matters to me. Um, I always wanted to have a red auger. Always. Mm -hmm. My granny had a red auger. So when we redid our kitchen recently, I thought, I'm going to get an auger. So I called auger, and I said, can I have a red electric auger, please? Oh. No, no, you can't. You can't because um, there is a, uh, a chemical used in the production of the red paint used on um, iron electrical appliances that is uh, no longer allowed under the uh, renewable regulations. Everything has to be fully recycled. And you can't recycle this tiny trace of, of chemical in the red paint used by agar. So you can buy a red electric agar in America, but you can't buy one in the UK. Mm. And that uh, is so minor. It's so minor, but damn, it's irritating. And it's, it's that kind of little detail of loss of sovereignty in what benefits a slightly, a slightly bigger deal than my it's red argument. It's, a bigger it's deal. these things that people say, well, I don't mind giving up sovereignty for national security. I don't mind giving up some sovereignty for um, full trade unions and agreements. I don't mind that, but hang on a tick. I really mind giving up sovereignty when I can't have my government decide who gets benefits and who doesn't. When I can't have my government decide what color electrical appliance I'm allowed to have in, in my kitchen to match my toaster, and all this kind of thing, that becomes, I think, an issue of sovereignty. It is not so much the big stuff as the detail. Well, I think it's a mixture of all of them, honestly. And I think you have to look on, on each of them. You have to do a sort of, effectively, a look at the benefits and look at the costs, and you have to mm. have a trade-off. I don't know the detail about the red argue. I don't know who actually came up with the argument. Why we, do you know whose idea it was to, to do this? It's, I mean, it's not aimed at augers. It's aimed at no, um, it, electrical it, was, appliances but, 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 having but, but to be is, but, uh, recycled. But you, might find, you might find that this is something that the British government would also think was quite a good thing well, to do. Well, maybe so. There maybe was a famous so. case of the the And we're breaking on regulations layer. ourselves, I mean, I, I, right? Yes, we are. We, we are. And I don't know. The, that's why I think it's important when you look at a regulation, you have to go into the depth of it. But there was, there's an interesting case of of, I think it was about a decade or, or so ago, of the, the lawnmower mm. directive. And there was this, this directive that came out of Brussels saying that we actually have got to, no lawnmower m may have more than so much noise coming out of it. Turned out to be Tony Blair's idea. Well, it, 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 it turned out <laughs> to be the British. And the reason why, and the reason why was because you had different noise limits in different European countries. And the Germans had set the no noise limit at a particularly low level, which meant that British lawnmowers couldn't actually be sold into Germany. So what we did is we lobbied to get a common level of noise, higher, which was higher, Germany. which was high enough so that British lawnmowers could actually get into the German market. Right, so German suburbia has been in crisis ever since. Yes, there's a lot of noise. <laughs> Okay, we've co we covered our three things. No, we haven't. We didn't what? cover the third thing at all. The third thing was all of the non-economic issues, whether it's things like, yeah, you but know... Security, I'm slightly dismissing because I refuse to believe for a second that we wouldn't continue to cooperate with um, the European Union on security because it's simply too important not to. There's yes. no way Europe wouldn't want to coordinate with us on that, no way we wouldn't coordinate with that. So simply dismissing that. Well, I don't think you should dismiss it. Okay, go on then. Because I think that in security there is always a balance between you know security and protection of civil liberties mm -hmm. and if we at the moment we're cooperating with the eu on security things like europol which is actually run by a brit for example um, but also this thing about the pas passenger records so there's this idea that we should keep access of people's passenger records, air, air travel, etc. And you can then 
go through all of these passenger records and use clever computer alg algorithms then to spot unusual travel plans and then perhaps spot someone who might be a terrorist. Mm -hmm. Now, some people think that's a huge intrusion of civil liberty. Other people say, well, we need to do this because we've got jihadists who are on the rampage. Um, the point is that at the moment, we are at the table. We decide where that balance is struck. If we left the EU... What do you think? Do you think that's an infringement of civil liberty as an aside? I, I think it is an infringement, but I think it's a necessary infringement. Mm -hmm. Or it's, it's proportionate, let's say, proportionate to the need. That's my view. I mean, I'm not absolutist about these things. Mm. I mean, I think you have to be pragmatic. And my view, therefore, is that if we left the EU, the EU would say, of course, we can cooperate with you on security. But this is the passenger records directive. Sorry. This is the, what we're going to do with Europol, etc. You cooperate with us, uh. but you have to follow the rules. And we're setting the rules. So it'd be exactly the same as in economics. If we wanted to cooperate, we could cooperate but we would then have no view on what the rules were. OK. Not convinced, but let's... <laughs> what, what? We could tag along. They'd say, yes, you can tag along. But they would be 27 mm. countries. They would have, collectively, they would be, whatever it is, five or six times the, the, the population, six or seven times the population of okay. Britain. They would uh, have greater weight. Now, the, uh, the next bit you mentioned, there was security and this non-economic bit. There was, what else was there? Security, oh, uh, security. There's, there's, there's foreign policy. Uh -huh. There's um, uh, environmental policy. Uh -huh. Things climate like change, global climate, climate change. change. Why, why does that matter? Why does climate change matter? No, not why does climate change matter. I don't know. Why maybe, doesn't maybe there are lots of people like <laughs> lots of Eurosceptics are climate change deniers. Uh, well, it doesn't really matter whether Nigel climate change Farage matters or and, not, and does Nigel, it? I mean, Ni the that's two not, Nigels, that's Nigel Farage and Nigel Morrison. It does, that doesn't Nigel, really like matter denials. for the purposes of this because the juggernaut is rolling. So whether you're a denier or not, the, the yeah. you know the regulations are still happening. Um, but why do you need to be a member of the EU to deal with climate change? You can make your own decisions about how you might or might not cut emissions. What you need to do is, if if, if your part, if, if the EU um, was one of the most significant players in these climate change discussions in Paris that we just had, they're basically three big players: the EU, the US, and China. By acting together as the EU, which we've done already, it meant that. Um, we were able to bring, we were able to have an influence on the ultimate successful conclusion of these talks of this summit earlier this week. If Britain had been on its own, um, I don't think anybody would have listened to what we had to say. And would that have made the talks less successful or more successful? What difference would it have made? It would have meant that our input would have been irrelevant. And what was our input that would have made a difference? I mean, the well, what we everyone, did everyone, is everyone in these talks is heading in the same direction, right? Everyone well, apparently not. wants the same thing. So what difference, whether the UK has much to say on it or not, we're getting a little uh, little caught up in ourselves here, aren't no, we? No, well, we are a little <laughs> bit. And, 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 and I, 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 we are getting a little bit caught up. And I'm, I'm, I'm not, a, not, not, not an expert on this. But my understanding is that it w what was, what's been really important, what, what, what happened is that the EU made an offer to these climate change talks, which is that we are going to do X, Y, and Z about these are going to be our targets for carbon emissions over such and such a period of time, or whatever it was, something like that. That's we made an offer, and that offer itself was then the result of a series of <laughs> discussions within the EU. In particular, the next set of targets. We've got mm. some targets up to 2020, and now there are some new targets beyond 2020. I think they go up to 2030. I'm not quite sure, but an important part of those new targets was that Britain actually asked for a more flexible way of hitting targets mm. than had been the, the case up to 2020, where there had been a lot of stress on you actually have to do X, Y, and Z in terms of renewables. Now, the, there are still targets on renewables, but they're not really important. The really important target is cutting the emissions, and how you actually get to cutting the emissions is what matters. So that's the difference that we had influence on that. And that change, my understanding, as I say, I'm not an expert on this area, but my understanding is that that change is something that Britain pushed for and achieved sometime earlier in the year, I think, in the springtime. To add into the EU's negotiating position as a whole. Yeah, as part of the EU's own policy, which in turn was a key building block of this global 
discussion. And the idea that Britain on its own would have had any significant influence, I think, is very but limited. On its own, maybe they, then Britain wouldn't have had to sign up for the deal. Ah, well, that's, that would not, I don't think, have been the case. Because I think that the peer pressure if you're not involved on something as important as, as the climate change talks. If, you, if we had said, no, we don't want to have anything to do with this. Peer I mean, pressure? Prime ministers suffer from peer pressure? Yeah. Haven't. Countries suffer. <laughs> Hugo, we're going to have to leave it there. Um, but we will come back to this. Thank you very, very much. And Hugo's book on the subject, should he want to know more of his views. Thank you. Thank you, Marin. I'm anticipating that there's going to be a run on cash that people are going to want real cash. And by real cash, I mean dollars. You mean actual notes? Pieces of paper. Actual notes. Pieces of paper, because the whole economy works on credit. In a, in a